All right. Uh, aloha, everybody. Um, it's been a while since we've talked, uh, but I thought it would be a good time uh, to <clears throat> talk about census and how busy we've been. I know there's been a lot of concern with this. Um, we, I think, had a Dan and Friends scheduled for next Tuesday, and but you know things have gotten more and more full. So um, I hope I'll, uh, I just plan to. You know, some of you already know this stuff, and some of you uh, I've only heard rumors, and some of this may be brand new to you, depending on where you work. But I thought I'd just go through, you know, kind of the state of affairs, uh, why this happened, or why we think it's happened. Uh, you know, what we've done about it, and you know, to maybe a smaller extent, uh, what we're predicting for the future. And um, if, like always, uh, if you have chat or questions, you can put up in the chat box. Uh, Mark's here with me today, and he'll help us do that. And uh, then I'll just update you on some of the stuff that's going on here, the construction and some other things. But that should most of the, our time today will just be spent, uh, you know, kind of explaining what's going on with how full we've been. So uh, let's just start with, you know, what's the problem? So to scale that for you, um, I'm not, I know some of you work in patient care areas. You probably may know this already. A lot of you might not, or you only know what your unit has. But um, we have on, uh, well, let me say, let me back up. Uh, prior to us opening any beds in the extended care facility, which was maybe about eight or nine months ago, we would have 124 acute beds to care for our patients. And when I say acute beds, that doesn't include the behavioral health patients or the OB patients or their own specialty. So 124, right? Um, we knew that we were staying really uh, close to using all those 124 beds and sometimes we were going past it. So we got a emergency waiver from um, a Medicare or CMS to open or license an additional um, 24 beds in our extended care facility South Wing. Right? Some of you also know this, some of you may not. Um, we license more than we could staff because you want to go at it at one time. And uh, we staff today about 18 of those beds. So then we, so that's 124, and then we added the 18. Right? Um, in addition to that, if we really get in a bind, we can open our um, overflow areas in our PACU, which is four, and in a short stay area, which we normally don't ever go over six, but we're at 11 today, and we usually have three or four beds, uh, depending on the type of patients that we can utilize in the OB space, right? Today, with 124 being full, we have 168 acute patients to care for. So our overflows uh, have um, short stay is 11, PACU has three, OB has one, TCU is uh, 16, and we have 13 acute holds waiting for beds in the ED. So that's uh, almost a 35% increase over being full. So that's why we're having this particular conversation today is because not only have we gotten more full than we were during COVID, um, it's been something that's been ongoing here for the last uh, really couple of months. And it just has gotten, it, it gets worse, it gets a little better, it gets worse, it gets a little better, but the baseline of full keeps going up, right? And so understandably, people are concerned. Um, we're concerned. So I want to spend some time, what are we doing about it? Uh, how are we going to be able to maintain services and so forth? Uh, I also want to share with you that it's a statewide issue. Um, it's an island issue. Kona has been not quite as full and maybe not quite as long, but they still are much busier than they were before. And then statewide, across the state, there are more inpatients in the 13 acute hospitals than there ever has been, and more than were during the COVID peak. So we're all experiencing this. Uh, we're all in it together. It doesn't necessarily make us feel better, but it isn't just an East Hawaii or a Hilo phenomenon. Okay. Um, so why? I mean, I get asked this a lot. Is this all COVID? Uh, the short answer is not. Actually, COVID is only a small piece of it. Today, we have 16 patients in the facility that uh, have a COVID diagnosis, and I would probably say about a third of them are there 
excuse me, that are positive for COVID and only about a third of those 16 are in because of COVID complications. So it's added a few patients, but it's not the issue. So the one, the, the issue likely the biggest cause, but not the only cause is that we're having a hard time moving our patients out of our facilities. Um, after COVID, uh, or really during COVID and after the worst of the pandemic, the long-term care uh, facilities found it harder and harder to staff. COVID was very difficult for nursing homes, affected their census, their cost. A lot of the long-term cares are for-profit businesses and uh, the market has substantially changed on them. Uh, our private long-term care facilities on the island have had to uh, limit their number of beds that they can uh, staff. A couple of our nursing home, our facilities have also had to do not as severe, but still some limits on beds because they cannot get staff for them. Um, they also, because of the economics of operating at a reduced level, they're much more particular about what patients that they can take. And all of these things have contributed where instead of a wait list, which is the amount of people that are waiting in the hospital to go to some placement beside their home, uh, for usually for us used to be 40, it's, I mean, excuse me, 20, it's now 40, so it's double. So that certainly has had uh, an impact on us. The other thing that we're seeing is that our patients seem to be sicker. And we're not quite sure why that is. It's not, it's an incremental more ill where the um, reasons that they come in are not two or three day reasons. They're six and eight and 10 day illnesses. Uh, there's some speculation that people have really avoided getting care during COVID that whole two, three year period, two and a half year period. And as a result, uh, you know, they're kind of paying for the consequences of deferred care or not seeing their primary and having their illness managed. And now we have more coming in needing higher levels of treatment. Um, our emergency room a volume has also steadily increased since the first of the year, which uh, for a couple of years, it actually stayed relatively low. And we wondered if that was the new normal. It doesn't look like that it is. Um, and so really those uh, maybe, and there's probably one other thing, uh, the community outside of the healthcare community, outside of the hospital really relies on a lot of different support services from home care to physical therapy to other, uh, you know, deliverers of care you get when you leave the hospital. And unfortunately, they also are struggling for staff. Uh, staffing in the healthcare industry has become quite the challenge. Um, and you probably hear in the news, there's been labor shortages. Uh, we're at full employment in most of the country and uh, the job market has gotten quite tough. And COVID unfortunately was a big challenge to a lot of healthcare, um, uh, I guess employees or, or people who work in healthcare and a lot of folks left. So we're dealing with a confluence of a number of different factors that I believe are driving where our census sits today. Right? Um, so what are we doing about that? Well, I mean, obviously our first and most important thing short term is to care for the patients. Right? And we've been doing this now almost on a slow burn for several months, but I really want to um, put out there my appreciation and sincere appreciation for all you guys who stepped up to work extra shifts to staff these overflows, uh, to manage an ER with half the beds you normally do, to keep coming in. Um, we've uh, facilitated some of that, some of that by honestly, we've done things like Pono Pay, other incentives to uh, encourage people to uh, perhaps work more than they would normally, or you know, just to reward them for that extra effort, and that has helped. Um, several months ago, we worked on an initiative to bring in more contract workers or travelers, and we've had some, but I would say mixed success with that because travelers are really hard to come by. And even though we pay quite the premium, uh, it, they reflect the overall labor shortage in the market. Um, we've also, and this is more on the longer term thing, but in some ways this has actually helped us in the short term, we did an open admission to both our nursing schools. So if you are a nursing school graduate, uh, if once you graduated, had that diploma, 
you had a job with us in our grad nurse training program. That didn't mean that you didn't have to successfully complete the program, but you had the opportunity to try. And we brought you on, if you were interested, immediately after graduation to work as a nurse aide, but also as an incentive to get you in our system and help us with our staffing shortage. Um, we, we actually pay them as graduate nurses, not as full, full nurses, but as graduate. And that has really helped to have uh, a lot of these young future nurses helping out on the floors and providing, actually filling some of our nurse aid gaps. We have two cohorts, one that starts, uh, has already started of 20, 23, the 23 nurses and another cohort that uh, starts in the fall in September, October with another 22. So all, all told, if I do a math right, about 45 uh, mostly local graduates of our schools that uh, will come and work with us and help with the staffing. Now that doesn't fix everything right away, but because this high census has dragged along so long and I don't see that it's going to go away immediately. These type of longer term solutions are really helpful because we have travelers covering those positions that these new graduates will go into. And if we have to, we'll keep the travelers and the new graduates to make sure we have enough staff, right? Um, when I say enough, I wanna be honest here. Uh, when we're really full, we're still lagging in how much we need, we need more. But I just want to share, I guess, the efforts in the overall picture. And we really are hopeful we can, quote, keep up. Um, I think we have a comment. Yeah, and so, yeah, I just saw it up here. Why is staffing gone down? Why are there shortage? Why do you think people left? Um, we tracked this, and what we saw is actually for our hospital, um, we didn't have a lot of people exit. We had some people leave certain departments and go work in other departments. Uh, we had a number of individuals that work in the acute bedside areas go work in our specialty areas or in our clinics. I think some of that is perhaps a consequence of COVID. COVID, nursing during COVID at the bedside, it was challenging. So people, honestly, there's like, you know, there are other opportunities when the organization, I'm gonna go work there. Um, most of our nurse aides have stayed, we just need more of them. So we've been fortunate, we haven't seen a mass exodus, but what we have seen is there's less in the market to hire as our census have gone up and we need more, okay? Um, there's, you know, questions about you know, things like critical care trained float pool uh, to cover an ICU or ED. Honestly, I can't get the ED uh, travelers and ICUs to cover the openings, let alone to have enough to set up a float pool. I mean, and I don't mean that that isn't a good idea at some point, but you have to hit the basic requirements first. Um, and uh, again, all ideas are certainly welcome, but we definitely have had challenges there. And I think in some ways, it's almost like we're trying to keep up uh, and we want to get ahead, but we can't quite get there. So much of uh, having appropriate staffing at our hospital that is uh, the solution is training and training our own. So we have not only these two large graduate nurse programs, you may have seen the article in the paper, we actually are doing now a nurse aid training program to train people right out of high school to be able to deliver those services. Um, we got 34 applicants for those positions and I think our first class is gonna be 10. And then some of you who are kind of in the know or involved in this, uh, we have, uh, we actually run in both for ICU and the ED two what we call critical care training programs or CCTPs, uh, one uh, like usually one the first half of the year and one the second half of the year, because ultimately the solution is to uh, build that expertise in our own community because as much as I appreciate the work of travelers to come here and help, that's not the solution, not long-term. Um, so a few more things, uh, uh, you know, people ask, well, what's gonna happen, right? Um, it's just gonna go on indefinitely. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, the, the reason being is that this is in some ways a, a statewide issue. Um, it involves facilities that are outside our scope of control. Um, I had a call from Mayor Roth yesterday, you know, he's wanting to update. He obviously hears in the community that we're really full and wanted to know how he could help. 
Um, and in most cases, I could say, hey, could you advocate for this? Because he wanted to get the mayors together on the other islands because they're dealing with some of this and the governor and some others and go, hey, what kind of help is needed? Well, he asked me, well, what can we do? Well, unfortunately, I didn't have a magic solution for him. I mean, I'd like to say, um, hey, could you have a you know, staff come and work in our nursing homes. But that, uh, in the long term, um, is something that, you know, may require how we pay for long-term care in our state. It's got to work financially if long-term care facilities are going to be sustainable, and so they're going to be able to take our patients. So I don't think there's going to be a solution overnight. I wish I could say, hey, a couple more weeks and we're going to be good. I, I think we're going to have to figure out how to deal, to deal with this as best we can and work on long solutions for this. We're still, I think, paying for the consequences of the pandemic. Um, for us, I already talked about some of our longer term solutions that we can do to control what we can control. So our training programs, um, we are trying to get in bulk up our own internal support services when it comes to, you know, a physical therapy and others. So if they can't get those, that care outside, maybe we can do some of that internally. Um, and then, of course, and I mentioned that just previously, I mean, we have to involve others and be part of a larger solution. And maybe that's a political solution or something to how our state itself, you know, provides some of the support for health care. Um, people ask about capacity, you, are you going to have enough beds, you're going to build more space, whatnot, right? Uh, so we are actively um, uh, advocating and planning to build an ICU and a med surge unit. I, I shared some of that with you. Uh, with our ICU funding, which we got uh, through the American Rescue Plan, unfortunately, um, after the regulations and specifications came out, uh, we didn't qualify for that. So we're starting uh, over uh, with our efforts to get that funded. Uh, it has not stopped our design and planning, though. We're in that process and are moving the permitting along. We got a couple of million dollars for that project for the design and plan. So that's a positive. So when we say if we get the funding to build, we're not going to have to wait a couple of years to design and permit. We should be able to go rather quickly. Uh, we do need more space here, and that is also part of our longer term solution. Um, and so a couple of comments in here, uh, other than OB and ICS, there's been discussion of expanding the ED. Um, uh, the short answer is there hasn't, because I actually believe our 28 bed ED could meet the needs of the community in the hospital if we didn't jam them up with ED holes. The issue is not really to uh, have a 35 bed ED with uh, 15 uh, inpatients sitting in there waiting for beds, uh, rather it's just to have the ability to move them through. At some point we may need to expand the ED uh, you know, from a population or uh, uh, demand uh, perspective, but right now our priority really is inpatient and ICU. So uh, questions about therapeutic staff, especially our rehab folks. Um, we, it's not a shortage of trying to fill those positions. They are even in harder, well, excuse me, they're even in a greater shortage from a contract health perspective than nursing. Uh, physical therapy, uh, speech therapy has been a challenge. Uh, with as far as uh, rehabilitative therapy for our extended care in other areas, we're actually looking at some uh, outside providers uh, that maybe have access to a deeper pool of rehab staff. We know that's a gap uh, on the inpatient and on the acute side. Um, so there was a comment there about increasing the pay of our staff. You know, that's particular. We all want uh, more pay. I will tell you that in a number of the areas um, in the hospital where we really have had either pay that wasn't competitive in the market, or we know our people were significantly understaffed that we have been working on shortage differentials to get people where they're paid fairly with their, you know, the, well, really what the, what the going wage is in the market. We don't think we should be below that. And a couple of our facilities that are, uh, very much in an area where it's even harder than in the Hilo to get staff. We've uh, looked at 
uh, even some facility differentials because you can't operate the facility without the staff. So it's been a selective approach. Um, obviously, our unions and others, they bargain for their members and represent them, and I think they do a good job with that. On our recent employee survey, uh, we score well above the national average on in regards to pay and compensation, but that doesn't mean that there aren't certain areas that we really need to uh, recognize that you have to pay more to be competitive and get those services. Um, for specific shorter term and to that point, you know, Pono pay is bluntly pretty generous. Uh, it is extra work and uh, sometimes it's, well, it's a lot of extra work. And so I think we pay that quite well and we'll continue to do that in a targeted way because uh, I think it's the right thing to do. Um, is it possible to offer non-benefit employees at least an option to pr purchase subsidized health care insurance? So we have uh, some folks who are uh, in what they call temp temp jobs or per diem jobs that don't come with benefits. Uh, most of those positions are actually, unless it's the preference of the person to have the flexibility with their scheduling, most of those are kind of entryways into benefited positions. Uh, I would say that 95% or more well, maybe not. About ninety-five percent of our of our positions do have some form of benefits with them. Uh, if benefits are important to you, do a good job in your PRN. I have a feeling you can get a job with the full benefit set. Uh, but I'll look into that. I think that's not necessarily a bad idea. Um, and would it be helpful to target CNA training programs in areas? This is a really smart question. And the problem with this, I believe me, our first go at nurse at aid training was in the long-term care is because their shortage is even greater than in the acute side. But in long-term care, because of CMS regulations, all the, the aides have to be certified nurse aides with a state license, which means they have to go through a certified training program. And the uh, state of Hawaii is very particular about the training requirements. So a hospital can't just, or a long-term care facility can't go, hey, we'll do a training program and then you can take your certification test and pass. We actually have to do, there's an unbelievable amount of, of I would just say bureaucracy required to certify AIDS for long-term care. For acute care, we're not uh, subject to that requirement, which is why we could do a nurse aid training program. I would say, a quarter of our staff here that work as aides in Hilo Medical Center are not certified, but doesn't mean they can't do a good job. But a really good question. I, I wish I could just say, yeah, absolutely, we should do that. But it's not, unfortunately not that easy. I think I caught up with the questions there. Uh, I'm going to switch gears, uh, talk a little bit uh, about some of the questions earlier about the, some of the building we're doing and other stuff that's going on. Uh, we, you may have saw a memo that I sent out uh, probably about three, four weeks ago regarding our negotiations with HMSA for their commercial contract. HMSA is certainly our biggest uh, healthcare, commercial healthcare provider, and many of our employees have HMSA and your family members do. So we send that out because we really got serious in our negotiations with HMSA because we felt that it was imperative that we get paid uh, in a, a you know, basically a fair amount for our services and that amount be uh, roughly equivalent to what the private hospitals got paid. Pay equity, just like all of us, right, is really important. Uh, and bluntly, we were willing to go to the mat uh, to have that happen, to basically be strongly negotiate with HBSA. And so we gave you a, you a heads up that we were actually going to go what they call non-par, where you don't take the insurance uh, we hope to avoid that, and uh, but we were very serious, which is why we let everyone know. Um, we were thankfully able to work out a good arrangement uh, with HMSA. I think it was a fair contract. There was um, a good deal of give, and I think participation on their part. You know, I can't like get into specifics because contracts are contradict uh, confidential. It was very uh, a, a very favorable outcome. Um, we didn't just tweak a bit our reimbursements, we were able to really look at resetting our base of how we're paid for almost everything we do. And we feel like we're in a much more equitable position that we used to, than we used to be in. Um, that is significant revenue. 
uh, to support our services and make sure they stay viable. And since expenses have gone really through the roof uh, for so many reasons, and probably you're seeing some of that in your own household, it was really good timing to be able to get, uh, get that uh, contract resolved. Um, I'll probably hold and just catch the questions that are coming up there at the end. Oh, some update on the construction, lots of that going on. So lobby, uh, unfortunately, we keep moving it back a little bit because of like many things uh, that's going on, the supply chain has just not been predictable. We've had a number of delays, but we're, we're thinking that August 22nd will open our lobby uh, and that all the pieces that we have a few more missing pieces that uh, hopefully will arrive and we can hold to that date. The Pink Palace, the old nursing headquarters out there, you may have seen polls going up for screening around that. Uh, August 16th, so not just like a week or so from now, uh, we should start to see the building actually come down. Uh, it will get uh, packaged. Uh, and because it's an old building, has some asbestos and other materials in it, it will be uh, taken down in a certain way that meets all the requirements and get trucked to the landfill. Um, uh, we'll scrape off a certain layer of dirt and then they will recover that with uh, gravel and then we're going to have uh, in-room parking spaces out there which I think will help uh, a lot of you who walk are probably a long way sometimes to get in from the parking lot. We'll have some more space which hopefully will accommodate some of the additional traffic that we've seen around here. So really excited to see that eyesore go down. Um, I think the symbolism of it being removed and our efforts to make our campus and our services more modern and up to date. I think just having that old building off our campus will really uh, help, um, I guess, in that, I guess, in the, in the visuals when you come to our campus. Um, 1285, the building across the street also has been subject to delays. Right now, we're looking at um, February, March for the opening. It is coming along. I think it'll be a great service for our oncology patients and also our outpatient services, but uh, uh, we're getting there. Um, some of you may or may know, not know, but we're, we actually have a, a holding room for the first floor uh, near in some of the clinical lab space right off the imaging area that will help service for our imaging patients. Uh, that uh, project's in permitting and hopefully will start here um, in the fall. We're, as you may notice, the background here is different than our, uh, my, the last place where I did Zoom because we're not in admin any, anymore. Administration has moved to the uh, MACA side of the behavior health uh, unit. Uh, that was the smaller eight bed unit that uh, what used to be the neurology clinic and now, but it's still in the building. Uh, so we've relocated here and admin, both nursing and regular admin is now, it looks like a big cavernous football field because it's completely gutted and it's gonna be turned into, I think a really nice orthopedic clinic um, that's gonna be all contained on the first floor and be part of our, you know, our rural health clinic offering down there. So uh, hopefully by the end of the year that will be completed. And then uh, the second stage of the lobby. So when lobby opens um, August 22nd, Within about a week or two, uh, we'll close off that stretch where you walk into the uh, patient service elevators. And for a while, for a few weeks, unfortunately, we'll have to all use the service elevators while that section gets redone to finish out the lobby project. Um, so well, those are the highlights. We got other things in the works to improve our organization, uh, but those are the ones that are on the near horizon here. So those are my main updates, and I'll see if there's uh, any other questions here? Um, let's see. Uh, one is while we appreciate all the growth with clinics, are there any plans to replace items in our aging facilities such as the chiller? And I think that's probably in reference to our CT, uh, a downtime or really an outage that we had for a couple of days. Um, it did involve a chiller, but it really wasn't that our chillers were aging. We actually have two very large chillers that uh, supply air conditioning or chilled air to the main campus here. So the oldest one was actually replaced last year. So it's brand new. And the other one, the backup, um, it, it actually is about seven years old. 
The chiller that went down for the CT is actually a mini chiller. It actually just looks like a smaller version of the massive one. And it services uh, three of the diagnostic imaging rooms, which is not an unusual thing to do for these type of uh, dedicated imaging rooms that have really high, uh, um, I guess, air conditioning needs. And that chiller is not actually, it's that old. Uh, one of the things that I don't want to get too much into the details that we do want to do, though, is to have a backup redundancy for that particular chiller who supports those important modalities. And that may mean that we buy another mini chiller or possibly that we have the ability to switch off that chiller if there's a problem and draw off of our huge acute 400 ton chiller. So um, we are working on replacing the old and the, and the organization, um, the OR, we have a major renovation plan for that and it's about ready to go to permitting. Oh, excuse me, actually, uh, it's probably a couple months from going to permitting, but we have money set aside for doing that one. And uh, because there are equipment in there that needs to be replaced, um, I can probably put together a laundry list of things that really, uh, that we want to, um, a lot of that we want to replace that are aging. And a lot of it you might never see in the entire time that you're here, but like our medical gas uh, air compressors, they're uh, getting placed, replaced this year. And there's a number of other things that we've gradually tried to uh, upgrade, like our IV pumps and our um, a lot of the uh, patient monitoring. I know we swip, switched out a whole host of those uh, Phillips monitors in the past year and our wilds and so forth. So we do have a lot of aging equipment. Uh, we have less aging equipment than we used to, and we're prioritizing, you know, replacing a lot of our infrastructure uh, because I agree the building is 35 years old and we need to be smart about keeping up our place. There was a question regarding creating a space we could have ED patients have been discharged and are waiting on rides to free up bed space. So that's the discharge lounge. Oh, wait a minute, take a place that had been discharged. Let me look into that. That's not a discharge lounge for inpatients. This is a discharge place for ED patients. So I'll talk with nursing about that. Um, uh, almost any solution requires staff. Um, that may be one of the reasons why we haven't done that, but that's an idea uh, that we may, you know, we have some merit, especially when we get, when we're running on maybe half our ED bed. So I'll look into that. So whoever contributed that, thank you. And will we be hiring full-time psychiatrists for behavioral health? Also, we'll be their psychiatric provider for our SNF ICF patients. So, uh, for so I'll just start with this: for psychiatric services, uh, telepsychiatry has to be a piece of how we deliver that service. Honestly, it's almost near impossible to consistently uh, have, uh, I guess, consistent presence in person. Right. We are able, though, if we can make um, the services that are required to support the inpatient psychiatry, if we make that job attractive enough where you're not always on call, that you can have a more predictable schedule, we can recruit full-time providers. So we have, I uh, don't know if they started yet, but I know that we have a start date for full-time psychiatrists uh, for the behavioral health unit. Uh, and Dr. Tracy Thornett, our psychiatric nurse practitioner, um, she will also be part of that faculty. And then we have our STEM telehealth psychiatrist will also help support the unit. Uh, there are four of them, and they've been actually working, both covering our ED and our psych unit now for almost three years. They're all licensed in Hawaii and credentialed on our staff. That is part of how those services will be delivered. Um, that's an industry-wide thing, and I think that's part of our solution here. And the second part of your question here about a psychiatric provider for SNF ICF uh, patients, uh, most of the requirement is to make sure that the psychotropic medications for those patients are properly managed and uh, that for those who have those particular illnesses, in that population that that's reviewed, that specific part of their care is looked after by a psychiatric provider. In the, uh, in the private uh, long-term care industry, most of that is actually provided uh, through a telemedicine uh, psychiatric review where they look in the EMR chart, 
uh, for that patient. They review their medications and so forth, and then they have the ability to order and adjust and change. Uh, we've struggled to have that covered in person. Uh, we've had a number of different providers do it, and our most recent provider uh, has, um, has left. Uh, we're moving to a model uh, where we can hopefully have a depth of coverage through a telehealth long-term care site service uh, that will be more consistent for us. So we're working on that. Uh, so much is changing in healthcare. We're trying to be creative. All right. So uh, I don't think there are any more questions. And I hope I've at least provided information. If there's questions and so forth, we if things continue, unfortunately, at this pace, uh, we'll probably get together here in the next week or two and just keep you updated because um, we certainly are dealing with some challenging times. And uh, we'll send out a request for questions ahead of time. I did this on pretty short notice. But um, thank you, everyone, for all that uh, really great effort to care for our community. Uh, we really are busy, and I know everyone's working hard, but I really appreciate the work you're doing. So aloha. Have a good rest of your day.